much time do I have? We usually finish about 12.15. 12, 12.15, 12, okay. So I'm done at 12.15. Well, how are we doing today? Oh, I like that. Hopefully, we're going to be doing awesome at the end. And uh, I, Dr. Tim Robnett, brought my manual. So, <laughs> um, I just want to start with some prayer. And um, I just pray that God could use his word today. Uh, he could use testimony today. And uh, to inspire you, to, to maybe motivate a little bit. But to also help us see the need outside the church. Uh, help us see our need inside the church. And uh, what, I, what I love about what you do here is you identify people, you pay respect to one another, and you serve. And I just, I just see an amazing community here. And it's crazy how God uses community. The gospel is what's been, you know, studying with Dr. Tim Robinette at Multnomah and, and seeing things. Gospel is community. And I think we're going to see some things in Scripture today that are going to be a little bit different. And uh, so my prayer, I'm just going to get into it. Lord, we just thank you. We want to revere you. We want to fear you. For that's the beginning, the beginning of life, the beginning of wisdom, Lord, is fearing you and having this relationship with you. And uh, Father, I just pray those that do not know you, they know about you in, in their mind, but they don't know and haven't surrendered, Lord. I just pray that today... What great news and great invitation to come to find life in you. Thank you for relationships, Lord, that you've made us for. Thank you for revealing yourself to us. Thank you for the word of God. And I just pray this, speak powerfully and just show us new things today. And that there be action coming out of here. There be action coming out of here with just a burden, Lord, to get into the rhythm that you have for us, this purpose, this, this life, this mission that you've all called us to, and I just thank you, Lord, that the world, the world needs you. And you've chosen us to be messengers with your perfect, timeless message, lifting you up to all mankind to draw the world to you. In Jesus' name. Okay. I want to start with uh, Father's Day. And, and uh, my daddy couldn't be here today. My dad is struggling uh, pretty bad. Um, he has stage 3 cancer. And um, just, just a, a big, big story. I don't like standing behind a pole, but I like to walk around, so bear, bear with me here. Um, he's had, he's had a, a tough life. He's had a tough life. And uh, I'll get into some of my story, but, but I just, I, I love my dad for what he stands for now. I love my dad that he found life in Jesus um, and that he is learning how to forgive. He's learning how to serve. He's learning how to do things at 55 years old. Uh, God penetrated his heart, he surrendered, and now he's using where he's at, um, pursuing God in the scriptures, and um, he, he's just, he's come to life. And uh, Dr. Billy Graham, a hero of mine, um, he said for Father's Day, I want to speak this over you, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. And um, as we're seeing just an attack on marriage, as we're seeing just an attack on dads and just, what is life? What are we here for? What does that look like? And, and you know what? All too often, unfortunately, you know, people don't have this father figure or these dads feel like they're failing. And um, I want to I wanna lift you up. I want to affirm you that uh, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, yet one of the most valuable assets in our society and paying respect to my dad, he'd be out there in the, in the streets with me, teaching me how to do juke moves, you know, in football so I wouldn't get tackled, teaching me how to shoot a basketball, teaching me how to always just always be at the, he was always at the games, he was always my biggest fan, and um, when I chose to, to go to Oregon State to play football there, he was probably one of the only voices that was positive affirming me when the evidence didn't really make sense that uh, I would go play football at Oregon State. So I love my dad, and I love you dads out there, and I don't want to lift you up. Um, I kind of, just getting into my story, I got struck with probably one of the greatest questions at a young age. And in Job 14, 14, you, you see Job ask a question, if a man dies, will he live again? So how did I come to that question at three years old? 
Well, it was uh, October 31st. It was Halloween. My mom made a little dragon costume. And this little dragon costume, and I was full of energy. And uh, I was going out trick-or-treating and then um, just destroyed the neighborhood, if you know what I'm saying. Kids running around and cutting corners and just... <laughs> I just, I laughed because my little son, my wife looks at me and she goes, were you just like this? I said, I'm so sorry, babe. Yes, I was. She goes, well, why is this my penalty if it was for you, you know? And, and, uh, and uh, I would put my mom in tears at times because I was just stubborn and just bullheaded, but they had me young. So she had me at, you know, 23 years old. And, um, you know, I guess it's young, young, um, you know, for our culture and time. And uh, back in the day when you didn't self-check out, she would see me throwing myself on the ground because I wanted some candy or whatever that looked like. And she would have to pick me up. And I was a big boy. So I, didn't, I looked, well, I was two, I looked like I was four. And so she's carrying me out and just crying her eyes out. And, and that night, uh, we come back and I always used to either move around and fidget and twist, bang my head on the pillow, do the things that, I don't know, ADD kids do when they're young. And um, I just remember a sharp reply back from her commanding me out of the room. And that was the only time I've ever seen my mom really stern with me. And uh, we went in that night to go check some things out. I remember waking up the next morning and the doctor came out. The doctor had news um, and it was essentially, she has malignant cancer. There's tumors all over her body. She told, my, uh, the doctor told my dad, uh, I still remember his name, Dr. Stewart, played football with his son at Oregon State. Funny how circles and things. Um, but he said, go take a trip probably less than six months to live. And so at that moment in time, at 27 years old, she was 26 at the time, 26 years old, she was faced with terminal illness and cancer. And um, from October 31st to February, I think it was 16th, in uh, 1990, February 16th, 1990, she passed away. And it's really interesting when you go take a look at people, what were their last words? What, what are the last things that they want to say? And... People would profess that my mom had this peace, but she was also kind of got too religious, kind of got too into faith, didn't want to have all these conversations with people just about them, recalling and recanting these memories. She went one-on-one -on -one evangelism with them on her deathbed where she had this strength. And as it was told to me, people were turned off by it. I heard a great question today. It's like, hey, I don't want to be, you know, a salesman of faith, but what does this look like? Well, my mom had this understanding that if you don't have life in Jesus, you're not going to see me. You feel sorry that I'm about to die, but I feel sorry that you are going to a place that's going to be utter lostness, blackest blackness in Jude. And so she was confronting them. They're feeling sorry for her, but her conviction outweighed that and terrified them to the point where it got them really thinking about God in that moment. Um, I was her second to last conversation, as it was told to me. Um, I was sitting on her deathbed, and uh, she's talking to me and trying to have a conversation, and, and, and I'm just looking everywhere. I'm looking out the window, and the helicopter starts coming down, and then lands right on the helicopter pad. And she used that moment in time, kind of like the Apostle Paul, use what you can to connect the message. And she used that message to me as it was told to me to say, son, do you see that helicopter? I said, yeah, 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 look at that helicopter. And she says, you know who's in that helicopter? I said, you know who's in that helicopter? Who is it? And she says, Jesus is in that helicopter. And he's coming out right now. And I literally thought, that's Jesus right there. Wow. And I ran out the door. I ran out the door and it was the last time I saw my mom. Essentially what she ended up saying to me was, son, if you don't know the Lord... That's the, knowing the Lord is the only way you're going to see me again. That was her last words to me. I ran out. I don't remember a hug. I don't remember a kiss. I don't remember anything like that. To my dad, it was the same thing. And uh, to my grandmother, that was the last conversation she had. It was the same thing. And then she gave up her spirit. She died right after that. And some people get really sad. But I look at it now and I'm like, well, what was my mom's legacy? It wasn't money. We had a $300,000 debt. So it wasn't money. It wasn't an inheritance. It was a legacy of faith. And she wrote out and she wrote out um, her dying prayers to the Lord. And she handed it to her best friend that led her to the Lord and said, My dying prayers are that God would love my Scott and love my son. That's my dad's name, Scott. And would put people back in their lives to lead, us, lead them back to God. 
because she just had this discernment that something would happen. It would be like a scattering would happen. And that's exactly what happened. We walked out, and when there's trauma, I guess, with youth, you don't think about a lot of things. You know, uh, during that time where you can't recall a lot of the memories, my dad took me every weekend. We would go kind of just numb the pain. We'd go camping and hiking and, and fishing and fishing and fishing. He loved fishing. But it was his kind of escape to get out of reality. I don't remember really one memory when he shows me the photos just because kind of the trauma of a loss of mom. And so we kind of go now. My, my dad remarries just an amazing woman and uh, just blessed me. I learned so much from her and, and who I am today. God blessed me with a mother figure in my life. Um, but it wasn't really a stance of faith. My mom was the one of faith. My dad was now freaked out. If she was a woman of faith and God didn't heal her and she, she thought he would, then ah, if I'm a sinner and I'm living in such a way that's in utter rebellion to God and his conviction, how is God going to love me? What's he going to do for me? And that was his thought process, and he carried that all the way on. It ended up just becoming do good, be good, you're a hall, carry the name, and that's what we did. And um, I just found that my outlet was really sports. So... I'm going to get time to shoot some basketball hoops with my dad. I'm going to get time in football and all these things. But we never answered the biggest question, if a man dies, will he live again? I remember playing Legos when I was seven years old in my room with a neighbor boy, and I asked, where is my mom? Where is she? I asked that at seven years old, and I totally remember it. And I remember him coming back to me. He goes, you'll see him again, or see her again. And... Uh, I then started just kind of going on this journey, kind of thinking about things, but then I was distracted by kind of life ahead of me and then ended up kind of fast forwarding, going into high school, uh, found an amazing young life ministry um, with a man that was passionate about Jesus that really just, just drew me in, just drew me in. I was in community. I was in around a lot of great places, went to a camp. I learned a lot about, about God in my mind. So I had the narrow way up here, but I never really surrendered here. So I had narrow way up here, but I didn't really surrender here. I didn't get to the broad... I was broad in my heart, but narrow in my mind. And I thought that, okay, I got the Christian band. I got the Christian cross. I, I go to church every now and again because we, uh, we were the Easter church people. So every time we'd go to, to this church, they'd be like, hey, are you new? And my dad would be like, no, we've been coming here for 15 years. And they'd go, really? Uh, you know, so it was just kind of a, it was the family joke is this is what they're going to say. My dad would totally predict it. This guy's going to ask me, hey, are you new here? We're going to say no. And uh, they go, really? Oh, welcome. And he's like, well, we've been coming here. And, and it, was just, it was just a family joke uh, to the point where we stopped going to church because we knew that we really weren't living for God. So why are we going to go pretend and play? Um, play that we're Christians. I wanted to, uh, to give you something here. Um, you know what? I was looking for evidence I was looking for a lot of things, and we have just some amazing opportunity. This, la this last week, um, a gentleman by the name of John Stewart. Have you ever heard of the Bible Answer Man? Bible Answer Man. Man, he just, he, this guy, he knows the Greek, he knows the original language, he knows apologetics. So you get a lawyer that studies law that's all into law. So guess what? He goes, why don't I do this for the faith? And then he started looking at apologetics as a way of evangelism. Well, why is it a way of evangelism? Well, you have evidence. You have reason and you have persuasion. So if people are like, oh, they're just dead, preach the gospel. Well, why did Paul go out and use what they had in Acts? And why did he take what they had, think about it, get in their context, and open up the mind? Otherwise, it's just all this, what we see as a heart. We just want this worship and this feeling. And I get that. That's amazing. But what about the mind? And so if people have different attacks or skepticism or things that you just don't know, really know how to answer. You know what it does for you? It puts you in a state of crisis. You know, the, the, the astonishing fact was what he was talking about by C.S. Lewis this last week in class is he says that there's this like the 60% shot chance that if you're in high school following the Lord, you're going to go off to college. And now when you go off to college, 60% of the kids are going to now fall away. Well, that was exactly me. Well, how come? Because in that ring or in that circle of association, the hedonism, the, the pleasure seeking, this is what we do and how we do things. And so, hey, wear the WWJD bracelet, man. Wear, wear, wear the, go, go to church. Praise God you're a Christian. It, totally good. But live like us. Be like us. Do this. And so we're so tribal now. We do things in community now really more than ever. We make decisions, especially with the youth and community. And the problem was I thought I was a Christian, but really wasn't. 
<laughs> and then I came to know Christ, and I had a lot of questions, and that inner circle would hit me with it, and I didn't know how to answer it, but I knew God was real and he was true. I want to give you a couple things here. Four key things that, uh, that I was taught this last week. It's just going to be kind of a crash course. But the cosmos, the cosmos, there was a beginning. Absolutely there was a beginning. But people are going to say, well, is the Bible real? Okay, well, let's take a look at what some other people have to say that maybe are um, skeptics or scientists or agnostics. What do they have to say? Well, let's take a look at this gentleman by the name of David Hume, a Scottish skeptic. He says, I've never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything could arise without a cause. So you remember the Big Bang Theory? It usually would throw people off. And so, bang, and then next thing you know, the, the universe just keeps going and going and going and going and going. Now they're coming back and saying, listen, something had to cause that, which means that to be an atheist or not have faith or believe that there is a creator God, that means that that's the stupidest reason or logic ever. They're coming in and saying, Something had to cause that bang. Something had to create. There had to be some type of intelligent evidence. Then we take a look at <laughs> we take a look at why this universe is hospitable to humans. If we were to go to another planet, let's go to Mars. Let's go to different places. We saw that. Who, who, who saw that Matt Damon movie, uh, Mar Martian? You know, we we last for what two three seconds. We last for a minute, two minutes, we burn up, we get close to the sun, and you know, and how, how come, how come this place of where we're at is so perfect? Let's take a look at Robert Jastrow, founder and former director of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and NASA. An agnostic. What does he have to say? The former... The, the anthropic or man-made principle, God made this for us, seems to say that science itself has proven as a hard fact that this universe was made, designed for man to live in. It is a very theistic result. A scientist caught between the two faces. interview with Robert Jastrow, and that was in Christianity Today in 1982. How beautiful is that? Let's build another case for God, life. The impossible odds of life arising spontaneously. We were talking about it, and I'll get in, but I just want to give you some things here. One times 10,000, one times 10 to the 40,000th power that this was even kind of an accident. That's like um, the likelihood of the spontaneous formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 knots after it. It's big enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. There was no primeval soup, neither on this planet nor any other. And in the beginnings of life, were not random. They must therefore have the product of pur purposeful intelligence that was Sir Fred Hoyle and Chandra... I don't know how to say the last name. Totally amazing. But they're agnostic scientists that based on evidence. The last thing, morality. Without moral law... There has to be a lawgiver. The Bible says that we actually have a conscience of right and wrong. Without moral law, we could not measure moral differences. The Hitler could be compared to Mother Teresa. You all know who uh, Ravi Zacharias is, Christian apologist? He says, some people love their neighbors, others eat them. What's your preference? <laughs> well, why, why all of this? I'm just finding that, do, do we really know, do we know our Bibles do we know the evidence that proves it? There's, there's, so, there's so many amazing things that I want to encourage you to equip you in to just start thinking about. What do the skeptics have to say about Jesus? What does science have to say about Jesus? What does logic have to say about Jesus? Logic, philosophy, all these things, it all points to Jesus. If Jesus is true, it's 100% true. There's no reason why we shouldn't be solid in who we are, our stances, understanding the fact that, you know what, we're called to defend the faith. We're called to stand and give an account and defend our faith. That's a command. So when people ask you, say, why do you believe what you believe? It's not just some random experience. It's the fact that, yep, God's real. He loves you. You're in a relationship. But also, let's be equipped and let's get trained up. And that's some things that I was talking to Pastor Stanley about. I love you, fathers. I love my dad. 
and I'm on a journey that if a man dies, will he live again? I go off to college, and um, now I'm playing football at a little small school. Um, there's performance-enhancing drugs. There's all these things going on. It's on the outside. You see a Christian cross. I'll leave the name unnamed. But we went off to go win a national title. It was God first, family second. You know, and then it was school, and then it was football, and then we get there, and then after my parents leave, I walk in the building. It was football, 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 football. We went on and won a national title, but it was totally, I got the ring. It's totally amazing, totally excited about it. I never wear it, and the reason why is I'm really not proud of what we accomplished and how we accomplished it. I saw guys turned off. I saw guys hurt. I just saw just his hypocrisy, and, and it led me to the question, do I need to become a priest in order to have a relationship with God? I went to Catholic Mass. It was a Catholic school. I went three times trying to figure out what is this priest saying? What does it look like? What are they doing in this Eucharist? And then all of a sudden I would come up and want to respond. God was compelling me out of my seat to come forward. And then they say, cross your hands. I'll pray a blessing over you. And then they wouldn't answer any of my questions. And I kept coming, and I kept coming, and I kept coming. I'd do, I would do exegetical work. I went and found some uh, um, resources, and I started taking the Bible. and started looking at what is salvation? What does this look like? Uh, God created. I totally know all this. Then I have this thought that hits my mind. It was divine. You're done. And then I go off. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not done playing football. You're going to go play football at Oregon State. I'm like, I can go play football at Oregon State. What are my inroads there? Well, it's kind of a, uh, have you ever seen Dumb and Dumber? One in a million. So you're telling me I got a chance, you know. The predecessors, my predecessor there was 6'3", 235 pounds. He ran a 4'340", and he played in the NFL six years. And he was only a year or two, he was two years older than I was. So that means when I transferred and got there, he was still going to be there another couple years. What's the likelihood of 5'10", 5'10", 195 pounds, beating out 6'3", 235. I run a 4'5", he runs a 4'3". That's the difference between like me and Pastor Stanley right now on a 40-yard dash. That's like forever. That's like forever. That's like forever. It's that bad. It's that bad. So I get there, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. And now I enter into a depression because all these guys look like they're cut out of stone. Okay, they're just huge and crazy and big and fast. And, and um, I enjoyed my experience there, but then it just, I, I got distracted. I got distracted to the party life. I got distracted just, just really into a lot of things, chasing immorality, chasing just that whole college experience, so to speak. I love the youth. I love college. I love middle school, high school, because a lot of times the top commencement ceremony said this last year. They said, you know what? Your life is meaningless. It's meaningless. Don't have a dream and a goal because if you look at the dream and the goal, you might miss the flashing thing to the right or the left. Get art. Get life. Get sex. Get drink. Get all of those things, and it's meaningless. And then everybody just started applauding, and that's now the top commencement ceremony. I was sick and buckled over, and I'm like, oh my goodness, and just started praying, Lord, we need to see revival in America. We need to get on these campuses. Where are the Christians that are defending the faith? Where are the Christians that are getting out there? Where are the Christians that are doing a lot of these things? Where are we? And, and how come these other people are taking their thoughts that have no evidence that they could stand on, and how come they're assaulting our convictions? That's what hit me. And then I started just going on this journey. Okay, Lord, what do you want to do here? I have two faithful friends they were praying for me over and over and over and over and over again for two years. They didn't give up on me. So when Dr. Tim's talking about making a prayer list earlier, make a prayer list. Another gentleman that was in high, uh, my high school with Young Life, he kept praying for me over and over and over and over and over again. He saw me and he'd see the fruit of my life and he knew I was dead because he saw what was coming out of my life and what I was doing, that I loved my sin. So the evidence then of a life of faith is now that I hate my sin and I start pursuing righteousness. So when I do sin, I'm grieved. And then I say, God, but I'm pursuing you. But I wasn't doing that. He didn't see my lean that way. He saw me reveling in this and making my life and boast about this. Praying for me. And these two friends, these two friends just realized, okay, we need to raise support to get this guy on a trip. We need to get him out to you. You know what the Navigator's ministry is? Amazing. Amazing, amazing ministry. Praise God for the Navigators ministry. But they have this opportunity 
that after the bowl game, I had a mohawk, I had a 19-inch neck, I was the wedge buster on kickoff, I ended up making it, uh, we, we traveled and special teams and all these things. Um, I said the F word in a noun, pronoun, adjective, and verb, and it somehow made sense. And, and that's just how, who I was. And people were scared of me because of this facade that I was putting on to try to prove to people, live for a reputation, that inwardly, I was dying. I was dead. I knew it. Here's how I, here's how I knew. When my little sisters would call me, eight and ten years younger, the twins are ten years younger, they'd ask me, hey, how was, how was the game? How was last night? How was all this? And I couldn't be honest about what I was doing and how I was living my life. And they were the ones that I loved so much. I didn't want them to do and live how I was living. It just created this conviction within me. And I couldn't stand the person that I was looking at in the mirror. Well, I decide. They, well, they, my, my, my two buddies, Justin and Dane, they raise support, knock doors, and they're broke. Just think of broke college kids, man. <laughs> they're knocking doors and saying, hey, we got this guy. He's playing football. But here's, here's what I want to do. If we get him here... God's going to change his life. I totally know it. And your support, money's not your money. Do you remember? Money's not your money. And people are, are now, they're getting rejected. They're getting shamed. They're getting all this type of stuff because they love me so much because they knew if they got me on a plane ride and to get out to this retreat that I would hear the gospel and I would root in deep and wide and I'd come back and they're like, God's going to do something with that guy. And they kept telling me that. They'd always speak what they'd see in me in the future as well. And I'm like, yeah, right, man. Yeah, right, okay, Christian, what do, you, what do you do? Kumbaya, Bible study, is that what we're about to go do? I'm not going. Dane came back to me, he goes, we've been talking about this for two years in your drunken stupor at two, three o'clock in the morning after you wake me up asking for forgiveness and all these things, and you forget, and then you keep living the same way. I'm tired of staying up with you. You're going. And I said, fine, I'm going. I said, but I'm going out. So I went out that night, and my buddy Justin... Um, God saved him and uh, two years prior, and he went and followed me around. And I went out that night, and I kept drinking, and I kept drinking, and I kept drinking, and Justin's having more fun than I was, and I'm supposed to be the one having fun, and it blew my mind. And uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, he goes, are you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. He goes, all right. And he had, I still remember it. He, got his, uh, he had his um, Ford Ranger. It was like this off-green you had to roll the windows down, college, and uh, I had my head hanging out the window, and it was cold. It's now January 1st. We just celebrated the new year, 2008. Justin starts playing the worship music, and it's Hosanna. By Star, or, uh, it's, it was uh, Starfield, You Remain. I still remember the song, and then Hosanna came on after that. And I'm like, what is this? And he goes, don't worry, bro. You're going to love this stuff. You know what's crazy? You know what's crazy is I looked at him, I put my head back out the window like a dog. I was living there like an animal. And I was like, I sure hope so. We got back at about 2.30 in the morning. I was hungry, he made me some food. I fell asleep, he woke me back up in the morning. And um, he's like, man, you stink. Stink of just all the alcohol and all the things just coming out of my pores. Um, he went and put me in the shower and made me some breakfast. And I looked at him like, what are you doing this for? And uh, he, <laughs> he drove me to the airport, and um, I just saw people that loved one another. I heard the gospel, and um, the, the Lord used the word of God, and uh, it, it compelled me out of my seat. I... Um, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion has never failed. They are new every morning. I then said, said to myself, the Lord is my portion. I'll wait for him. It made sense to me. Um, it was just, I don't know how the Holy Spirit used it. Forgiveness, portion, person. I need this relationship. I went up to the guy. I said, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to be saved? Acts 16.30. And he was taken back. And he goes, you pray. Surrender your life. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And are you willing to follow him and lay down your life? And I said, yes, yes, yes. My buddy Justin's wanting me to go to the meeting later on that, that night. It hasn't even started yet. We did like a little round table discussion. And then, and then what ends up happening, what ends up happening is I get on the phone and I start calling my family. I said, I need three Bibles. Justin's like, we're about to go. I said, no, don't, don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. The Lord's good. The Lord's good. Now I start getting this passion. 
And I want to get into the text here. I want to show you something here. In Mark chapter 2, I have to give you that because when I read, the, read this passage, I was in Romania preaching to some youth, and you know what's so beautiful? When you got the youth, you have to get creative. How, what does everybody think we are? Boring, judgmental, we don't have fun. So we have these youth and some street teens, and they're all around, and the pastors there are like, hey, you probably got 15 minutes. I said, okay. And um, it just came to me. What's your favorite superhero? I had Spider-Man come out, Hulk Hogan come out, or Hulk, the Hulk come out, all these different ones come. And then I remember seeing a picture of all the superheroes around Jesus saying, and this is how I saved the world. And I, I, how I appealed to them, as I said, did they ever defeat the, the enemy? And they go, well, yeah, but then he always came back. And so they had to go back out at the work again. I said, okay, what was their strength? What was their limitation? And then shared the gospel, and five youth, five youth gave their lives to Jesus that morning, and it was so amazing. I was there, I was staying up, we're about to go into a church, about to go do some other things, and the Lord woke me up, and this is rare that this has happened, it was 3.30 in the morning, and I kind of love my sleep, and um, Mark 2, 1 through 12, and I start reading, and I start crying, because I saw Justin, and I saw Dane, and I saw him put me in a position of communal faith for God to do in the salvation portion what is happening here, and it came to life. So whenever I speak of this, I'm like, this is my story. This is my song. I have to share this. Here it is. Mark 2, 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, that he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carrying by, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and, when they, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take up your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, take up your mat and go home. He got up, took up his mat, walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything Like this. Okay, now let's unpack this a little bit, give you some context. Jesus comes out, he starts baptizing. Um, John John the Baptist prepares the way. He starts, um, you know, basically baptizing, and then he calls his first disciples. He drives out an impure spirit. So he drives out a demon, and then he heals many. So what happens when the miraculous happens? People start what? They start talking. And this talking starts spreading enthusiastically. And this spreading enthusiastically then has people saying, whoa, 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 I, have he- I want healing. I want a physical healing. So what do I need to do? They didn't really want the spiritual fix. They wanted the physical fix. And then a leper is healed. Jesus gets away before that, and he spends some time with the Lord. And when he's spending time with the Lord, is very early in the morning. We need to pattern our lives around that. It was dark. Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place, and he prayed. Jesus replied to the people when they were looking for him, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I could preach there also. That's why I've come. That's why I've come. He heals a man of leprosy. This man of leprosy, you know what leprosy is? Limbs start falling off. You can actually get it. Very contagious. Back in that day, um, the teacher's law wouldn't even touch or get in the shadows of the people with leprosy. And Jesus heals a man of leprosy and he tells him, go, do not say a word. What does the man do? Jumps with joy and he's just going and telling everybody. So now, everywhere Jesus is going, people are packed. And what do we see in this house? The house that Jesus is in, what do we see? We see that there's people everywhere. And these friends here, okay, we got a friend on a mat, palsy, palsy paralyzed. And you can't express your faith, but 
we're going to put you in a position to get healed because we know this man, Jesus, the Son of Man, can heal you. Well, he let him take him. It was kind of like me on a plane. Fine. I'll go if you carry me. I'll go if you pay for me. I'll go if you go do that. So the man is allowing them to carry him. They carry him. And what happens when they get there? They see all these people in a room. I have a question for you. So if you have a friend, you need to get him in front of that room or that speaker. Say it was Jesus. And it's packed. Do you stop and say, oh, I need to find the next one? Ah, bummer. Sold out. You know what these guys ended up doing? All right. I know you might fall off your mat. But we're going to tie some ropes, man. We're going to get you up there. And this, this man's like, what are you talking about? These raving, lunatic, madmen of faith that believed that Jesus could heal them, his, their conviction allowed him to do things that he couldn't do for himself. And what do they do? They get on top of that house, and they kind of figure out, back in the old days, break through the roof, and then boom, and then they start lowering them down. All right, Jesus. Hey, sorry to uh, interrupt everything that's going on here. I know it's busy. I know it's a packed house. But, but, but here's here, you know, can you heal him really quickly? And then we'll get on out of here. Jesus stops absolutely everything. And every time that there's a miracle, what's really interesting, Jesus is doing what? He's explaining or pointing to who he is. He's pointing to who he is. So every miracle had a purpose. Every miracle today has a purpose. Every miracle today has a purpose. So... What ends up happening is he, whatever he's speaking about, he doesn't speak about that anymore. He gets off the topic, and now he sees and he has this intimate affection towards these four faithful friends and this man that's laying on him with palsy, laying dead. So the question is, what is deadness? Deadness, as we were talking about this last week and studying and going through, is, is, it's not when you just die physically. The spiritual death is actually separation from God. So what if, in this case, the man didn't get up, but Jesus healed his sins? Jesus would care more about healing the sins of the man than getting up and walking out. Do you remember that story where the ten lepers are healed and only one came back? My dad called me up and he says, son, only one came back. What happened to the other nine? God was working on his heart. It was absolutely amazing. We had a great conversation. And I'm like, dad, isn't that crazy? We could seek the healings of God, the blessing of God, all the amazing things of God, but yet we forfeit the relationship and really what heaven's all about, experiencing that relationship with God. And um, what ends up happening now is he sees their faith. It was communal, the gospel's community. He sees their faith. The four and this man, they couldn't express his faith to be lowered down. And he sees their faith and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. He calls himself the Son of Man 28 times, and he's like, all right, fully God, fully man, I'm about to do something amazing right now. He puts his reputation on the line. What is about to happen right now, if he does not do what he is about to say, and it, this man does not come off the mat after he says it, he'll probably be stoned to death, killed. There's no way that we would be Christian today because he'd be a liar and a lunatic. What does he say to the man? Well, at first he communicates to the Pharisees. Why does he communicate to the Pharisees? He knows what they were thinking in their heart. What do the Pharisees believe? Rejected the resurrection. They didn't even believe in it. So they don't even believe in the resurrection. And Jesus is walking around as we see in, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, or Moses was, and all that he's saying, I am, I am. Well, it's ludicrous. It's crazy. And he's like, fine. Like apologetics that we were first starting on. The cosmos, anthropo- an- anthropic, made for man, life, all that type of stuff. Now watch this. Jesus makes a claim, and he goes, I'm about to show you I'm for real. <laughs> so, the evidence of his claim is now, son, get up and walk. Let's first talk about that. Son, your sins are forgiven. So he's in a forgiven state, he's in a forgiven state, he's laying there, and he didn't just leave him there. He's laying there in a forgiven state, but he didn't just leave him there. And what he ended up saying to him is he says, get up. I've saved you to serve me. I've saved you to send you. So he gets up, and in plain view of them all, he walks out of that place, and what ends up happening? They're all amazed. And when you go through the book of Mark, I think it's seven or eight more times after that, 
And they were all amazed. And they were all amazed. And they were all amazed. So if Jesus didn't do the miracles and perform the miracles and just said amazing things with authority, we wouldn't be following him today. And there's a story of that that we were preaching in uh, Romania and a woman was blind and her right eye comes up. She was in her mid-60s and she says, I believe that Jesus wants you to pray for me, to heal me. And I said, okay. And I was, okay, if you want to do that, I've never been a part of that before, but I'll pray. And, and we prayed and this woman was overcome by the Holy Spirit. Um, God used us to, to lay, lay a hand on her upper back and she encountered God and her sight was restored. And she started jumping off the ground and talking like a mad woman. And everybody was flocking to her and talking about what just happened. And we actually captured it on video. My little sister actually ended up getting it on video. And there's many, many thousands of experiences like this, even in our own lives. And we were talking about a man today that there was prayer and the cancer was gone. Praise God. Praise God. I tell you, get up, take up your mat and walk. Jesus showed, Jesus showed that not only can he forgive sins, that he was God, he has the authority of God, but he also said, I love you so much because of community faith that I'm going to bless this community faith and now I'm going to save you and now send you and you're going to be my, you're going to be my, my vessel. Jesus saw their faith. There are three narrative accounts of this. What is faith? What does faith give you? Forgiveness. So it gives you this forgiveness and I would just say, what was their faith? It couldn't be defeated. It couldn't be overcome. It wasn't stopped. It was a war. It was a war. It was a war against the circumstances they saw. I can't get in the room. I got to get on top. Once I get on top of the roof, I break through. I lower down. And so I believe evangelism is also prayer. I believe evangelism is also action. I believe evangelism is, according to the word of God, the gospel message. I shared this with my dad. I shared this with my dad, and I want to share with you as we're wrapping up. Awesome, what's your motivation for being here today? Well, if I didn't believe in hell, and if I didn't believe in judgment, I don't think I'd be here today on Father's Day. I think I'd be here, I think I'd be with my family. If I didn't believe that there was great reward, but also great penalty, I don't think I'd be standing here right now. Um, I know who I am. I know that I have broken the law. I know that I've sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and God forgave me, and that's why I'm here. Now, God told me to tell a story, and that's why I'm following through on the story. There's other people that really are way smarter than I am. I had an experience with God. I had an experience that will just blow your mind. I can't wait to tell you more about it one-on-one or various things. But I also do know that he reveals himself in the word and he's calling people to himself. And so I believe it's a divine appointment here to affirm you in the faith and also to invite you if you don't know him because what's it really all about? Is this cross really just so that we can live a better life? I don't think so. A lot of people wear a bedazzled cross, you know, the, the, the gold and the chains and all this type of stuff, but, but it really, what, what is it? It's like a modern day electric chair. Could you imagine people wearing an electric chair on their neck? <laughs> it was a rigorous cross. It was an awful cross. It, it, was, it was one that they tore up, that when he even touched it, and it, it would even impale him. And, and, and what was the penalty? So what did this Jesus do? So God created... In Hebrews, he revealed himself in the past with prophets. He revealed himself how he wanted to reveal himself. How did he reveal himself? Through Jesus. The king of glory, 10,000 times 10,000 angels. Peals of thunder and lightning. The holiness of God. The, the, the 24 elders throwing down their crowns. The seraphim holding their eyes. Holy, holy, holy. This is the one, because of our problem, we screwed it all up. We chose sin. We broke relationship with God. We were separated. God knew that, but he gave us a will to go choose it. And then he said, I'm going to go fix it. Could you imagine a hundred million angels watching the king of glory, the name above every name, step down off the throne, come walk, and then enter into the humanity that he created, learning how to talk and walk and breathe? Luke 2.42, learning how to like love a mom, earthly mom and dad that are sinful. 
Learning how to love a, a brother that didn't even believe in him that he was the Messiah till after he resurrected James? Could you imagine? And yet he was blameless. He was faultless. Looking back at the Exodus, do you remember the blood that was spread to go across the door frames? It needed a lamb. Well, this lamb in Revelation 13 was the lamb that was slain before even the foundation or creation of the world. So the slain lamb enters in, becomes our example, and what does he do? He goes to the cross. He does everything he said he would do, 80 prophecies, major prophecies fulfilled. That's insane. And then, and you could test it, it's, it's, it's evidence you could test that demands a verdict like Mr. McDowell, Josh McDowell, I believe I said his name correctly. And then he goes to the cross and he says, he says Lord, take this, Father, take this from me. Take this from me. And then he comes back to the disciples. You're still sleeping. Why are you still sleeping? Pray. Okay. And he gets back. Take this from me. Take this from me. Sweating droplets of blood. Why are you still sleeping? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he goes, okay, the time has come. My betrayer has come. And then he's betrayed over to the hands of men like a sheep before his shears is silent. He didn't even defend his stance. The one that could call down seven legions, I think it was 12 legions of angels, could call down rapture right now, says this must be done. This is the, 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 the will of the Father. I'm going to go do it. He's, his beard plucked out, slapped, spit, mocked, three unfair trials, whipped so bad, 39 kill a man, and he took that 39, and then he had enough by the power of God in him to carry that cross and then we have a, a man from Cyrene come to help him. And then he goes, and then there's two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. And people say, I believe in Jesus. So do the demons. So do the demons. Wrapping up. So do the demons. The one on the right looks at him and is mocking him. They're both kind of mocking him. But hey, get us down off this cross. The other one comes to his senses because he hears them crying out as Jesus is impaled with nothing left, hands through his, nails through his hands and on his feet suffocating, nothing left in his body. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgive, and he's hearing them and he comes to his right senses and repents. And he says, hey, I, I believe. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. And what does Jesus do? Impaled, bleeding, nothing less, the crown of thorns nailed into his hand, beard plucked out, body torn open. He just, he looks at me, he says, you'll be with me this day in paradise. I shared that message with my dad before he got cancer. I shared it with him. And I said, I said, dad, he said, he said, son, and he wouldn't mind me sharing this. He says, I look back and I just see all the bad things I've done because it's on this scale. What does the enemy want to do? Destroy you. He wants to take our lives and tear it to part. And Jesus left the throne so we could find life and life abundantly. So he goes to the cross. He says, you'll be with me this day. And my dad looks at me and he says, wait a minute, son. So you're saying, now he gets all passionate on me. I'm like, come on, dad, come on, yeah. I could live 80 years old and spend my whole life and waste my whole life. And I could live to 85 in those last five years. You're saying with my belief and trust and faith by grace alone and Christ alone that died for me. Believing in him and following him those last five years. You're saying God's pleased with me? I said that's exactly what I'm saying. He gasps one on one conversation. And he said that's the greatest news I've ever heard. And I look back and I'm like what am I sharing right now? What's it called? The euangelion. The good news. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. What's our hope? What's our hope? Our hope's in the resurrection. The power of sin's gone. In the past, we're redeemed. It's, all, it, it's done. Power of sin present. In the future, that we're going to be glorified and have the presence of God. What's heaven all about? Is it about the diamond streets and the gold and all this? It's going to be sweet, but that's like concrete. That's like concrete. People are going after all that stuff. They're going after all these things. And, and I bet Jesus is like, really? The best way is my way. I'm going to blow your mind. But it's really about me. It's really about relationship. So that's what I think we need to bear down on. Here's my question. 
And the question Dr. Billy Graham asked that just so resonates with me, how is your heart? And that's what got posed to me with my friends. That's, got po- that's what got posed to me. And um, here, here, here's what I want you to do. I just, I, I just want to just take this time and I just want to just, let's just bear and just focus on the Lord. Let's just, you know, just spend some time with him. And I, I, just, want to, I just want to ask, do you know him? How is your heart? This is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Christ Jesus whom you have sent. Do you know Jesus? Are you in a right relationship with him? Do you believe like the, cross, like the thief on the right? Or are you pleading like the thief on the left to find life and fulfillment? Could you imagine the joy that that man had with nails through his hands and feet, suffocating knowing that he had hope because he had the Messiah and salvation? How's your heart? Want to pray. God, I just thank you, Lord, for this message. I thank you, Lord, that you saved us from our sins. And Father, thank you that you died on that cross. But that's the bad news, that you died. The good news is you did everything you said you were going to do through your son, Jesus Christ. And you rose from the dead. And it sure is anything. You showed yourself to over 500 people, 11 different sightings. And these men, 11 out of the 12, ended up going to a martyr's death, cut by sword, shot by arrows, drugged by horse. They could not deny you. And I just pray, Lord, that we have a faith like that. And Lord, for those that don't know you, those that that heart's just not right, they need you, they need to come to you, I just pray with head bowed, heads bowed and eyes closed. If there's anybody here and that's you, I'm going to do just kind of a bold call. I just want you to raise your hand and say, I need to get right with Jesus. I, it's in my head, but it's not my heart. My heart's not surrendered. Because what he's calling you to is to trust him and love him like you're sitting in that chair with a reasonable faith. He wants you to put your faith in him to pursue him. Is there any here? Any here? Their eyes, eyes closed, head bowed. They need to get right. Amen. Father, another call here is what I see in the text is that you didn't just save us to just live our own little lives. You saved us to live in your rhythm. And um, another call here, Father, if, if there's people here, if there's people here that, that have been hurt, that are laying in that palsy state, They've been hurt by the church. They've been hurt by spouse, kids, failures, addictions, greed, possessions. They're just, they're just stuck. They're, they, 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 they know what you've done. They believe it. They trust in you, but they're paralyzed. Lord, for those individuals right now that want a miracle, that want to cry out to you, that want to receive just that command to get up and walk, I want them to stand right now. Is there any that need to stand? Anybody that needs a miracle? Anybody that needs to hear God say, get up off your mat and walk? Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for eternal life. I thank you for passion. I thank you for purpose. I thank you for everything that you've given us. Yourself. And Lord, may, may we just carry your presence into this world. Give us boldness and conviction. Give us passion. Give us excitement. Help us to study late into the night and get up early in the morning. Help us to use all of our plat- platforms to glorify you in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in our businesses and our work environments. Lord, worship, giving you worship to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.